All right, hi everyone, my name's Erica, and I'm one of the engineers at Ease. Uh, it seems that because a lot of you understood those puns, uh, you've probably heard of us. If not, um, we are a technology platform that facilitates marijuana delivery all over California. All right, so, um, yeah, it's awesome, right? Uh, uh, come to the hiring mixer on Friday, you'll see. So, um, who here is primarily a web developer? All right, well, I am so honored that you came to my talk, because I'm not. Uh, I'm primarily an Android dev. So perhaps you're wondering, why is an Android dev speaking at Reactathon? And the answer is that React Native is absolutely taking the, the mobile world by storm. So uh, in case you're not familiar, React Native allows you to write code once and run it on both iOS and Android platforms and then it compiles to real uh, native UI components. Uh, super exciting stuff. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of Ease's history and why we decided that React Native makes sense for our business. So, Rea um, so Ease has two apps. One is the driver app, which the drivers themselves use to facilitate deliveries. But then we also really wanted to have an app that our consumers can download from the app stores. Now, what do you think the number one thing is that an Ease user wants to do with their app? Buy marijuana. Uh, what's one thing that we're not allowed to do according to the App Store policies? Sell marijuana. Uh, <laughs> but we still think that there's a huge value add in having a native app in the App Stores, um, an enhanced sign-up process, uh, a referral center, ETA tracking, push notifications, all kinds of stuff, in addition just to general discoverability. So we really wanted to make that app. Uh, but we still had a lot of questions in mind because uh, the app stores are very, very transparent about what their, their policies are. Uh, that's total sarcasm, we had no idea. Uh, so the, other than the fact that we cannot sell marijuana, have end-to-end -end marijuana transactions, we weren't really sure what we'd be able to do. Um, can Ease even have an app in the App Store? We, so we want to be able to iterate quickly on that. We wanted to be able to share resources with front end. And it'd be really great if we could share some uh, JavaScript code with web. So before I joined, Ease had no uh, full-time employed app developers. We had one full-time iOS contractor, who, uh, Harry, who spoke yesterday, if you went to his talk. We had one very, very part-time Android contractor who basically just cut Android builds but we had a very, very sizable team on uh, React.js for the front end. So then I joined Ease, uh, same situation, except now we have one full-time Android developer, uh, which was me. So when I joined, uh, shortly afterwards, uh, they released uh, version one of our consumer app, which was just a very quick iteration that we were able to get out um, <laughs> using React Native and borrowing a lot of our front end resources. And we still had a lot of driver app legacy code that was written uh, a long time ago by contractors. Um, we really wanted to get rid of that entire code base and rewrite it. We had a whole, like I said, we had a whole bunch of React.js front end. We had one iOS contractor, one Android developer. It made a lot of sense for us to write, uh, write code once in React Native. So then we ended up with driver app version two and that's still what the, the drivers use today. Um, once we established that we could at least get ease for a bare bones uh, sign up experience into the, the app stores, uh, we decided to re-architect it, put out a version two uh, using completely native navigation. Uh, we use the library that Wix puts out and also a full code re-architecture that was much more scalable. Uh, then we were able to make some more hiring. Uh, we got two full-time iOS uh, employees another Android employee as well as myself. We have four developers, a quartet, so to speak. Uh, so now we have just a lot more native resources and we, could, uh, we have a lot more options there. So Justin, my uh, other Android counterpart, and I decided to move to a, uh, for various reasons, for the consumer app, move on to Kotlin, uh, which is uh, interoperable with Java, very similar to Java, uh, just because now we have the resources to support it and we thought that we could maybe make a, uh, a better experience and also better tooling, more, uh, more libraries that were supported. The driver app we decided to keep on React Native um, and the iOS team uh, decided to stay on React Native for theirs. It just happens to be a lot further along, a lot more well supported for iOS. But we wanted to move over to a, uh, a native Kotlin app. However, 
we still had a lot of JavaScript code that's shared with the consumer apps and also shared with the, with the front end. And I wanted to see, can we still share some of this JavaScript code uh, in our native app? And by that, I mean actually have a shared repository where iOS, uh, front end, and Andro native Android is all using that code from the same repository. So there's two reasons that we might want to do this. Uh, one is the promise of velocity, and the other is parity. So uh, velocity seems like the obvious uh, reason for having shared code. Uh, you just write it once. Um, often there's fewer short-term gains just due to the overhead in writing that glue code uh, that'll allow it to be modular and work on all these different platforms. Uh, if you have existing JavaScript code, you're going to have to re-architect that just to make it more modular. There are, so, so you do uh, sacrifice a lot of short-term velocity. Maybe there's long-term gains. That's just something that you'll have to evaluate in your own situation. Um, and also tooling is very difficult in terms of your continuous integration, your automated builds, your unit tests, and so forth. Uh, but parity is something else altogether. I think that parity is a very good reason to have shared code um, written in JavaScript that you run also on native or React Native apps. Uh, Obviously, that, that holy grail would be that one repo where you're actually using that exact shared code on all of your platforms. You'll still always have those velocity trade-offs. So for example, if you have calculation code in selectors uh, that assumes uh, an underlying Redux implementation, you'd have to then rewrite that to be Redux agnostic. Um, but you do get that big parity win. So let's talk about a real-world example that we had at Ease, which is order ETA calculation. Okay, this is, um, this happened to the CEO when he placed an order, so this is a little embarrassing. Uh, but we're all React devs, so this was the back end's fault, of course. Um, <laughs> so uh, with the new regulations with uh, recreational marijuana, uh, a lot of changes were made in the back end. It was communicated a little better to web than it was to mobile, and those changes in terms of how that endpoint worked um, affected our ETA code. Uh, if we had one shared repo, this embarrassing situation never would have happened. And then even something like um, just looking at what ultimately gets calculated as the ETA, if for whatever reason the consumer has the app and they also have the web page open, it's a much better experience if we know that it's always going to be the exact same thing. So we have some logic in the selector um, on JavaScript that calculates the ETA. Uh, first, it pulls the endpoint for a timestamp. Uh, the timestamp can change just due to various traffic conditions, things like that. Uh, we had range padding, so you'll see in the previous page it says 18 to 21 minutes. That's added depending on where the order sits in the driver's queue. Sometimes they might have three or four orders queued up. And we also determine the status. So if you look at the stepper in the previous screenshots, order received, order prepared, and so forth, we, we have some fairly uh, complex state machines that determine what the status is that we show to the user. So when you share code between React.js and React Native, super straightforward. Uh, like I said, iOS is still on React Native. All you do is create an NPM module. You do NPM install, really easy. Uh, sharing code with a native app, you know, I'm going to be talking more about Android just because I'm an Android developer. Uh, it's a lot more complex. So these are the basic steps. First, you want to modularize your shared code, make it so that it's not uh, dependent on any you know, underlying implementations. You set up your Android app to interface with React Native. You set up your communication from Android to JavaScript. And then you also set up your communication from JavaScript back up to Android. Um, so this is a pretty big pitfall in terms of uh, communication between native and JavaScript uh, components in React Native. It is always asynchronous, and that's just part of the nature of React Native. There, there's no way of getting around that. Um, so your only options are either to use callbacks or emit events. Uh, we didn't really want to use callbacks just because there's a lot of danger there in, in, uh, in memory leaks. So we chose to emit events. And so the implementation is a, a pub sub model, which is a publish subscribe. So it seems like kind of a, an unintuitive way of just performing calculations and calling methods. But ultimately, that's how you have to do it if you're going to communicate between uh, native code and JavaScript React Native. Uh, you just broadcast events that the other side can subscribe to and do something in response. So I'm going to first talk about communicating from Android into JavaScript because it's a, uh, our app basically has an Android skeleton 
Uh, first thing that you need to do is serialize the data so that it's in a form that can be sent over the JavaScript bridge and understood in the JavaScript layer. And then we emit the event to actually send over that serialized data. Uh, so this is basically how it works. We have an endpoint that produces a bunch of JSON data. You're all familiar with that. Um, whatever our API client is on the native side deserializes it so we get uh, a Java or a Kotlin object that we could do stuff with it. Um, ultimately, it needs to be something called a writable map, which is the serialization object that we could pass through the JavaScript bridge into React Native JavaScript code. Um, but something has to happen to go from that Java or Kotlin object into the writable map, and it's not really clear uh, how you're supposed to do that. It's not very well documented at all. So I spent a lot of time just digging into Facebook's internals in GitHub. I found something called Bundle JSON Converter. Uh, they've since taken it down, but if you search for Git in GitHub, you can usually find it. And it's just their internal um, serialization tool that can take a, a bundle, which is Android's serialization tool, and uh, convert it. You, you have some static helper methods that allow you to convert it to a writable map. So the way that it's implemented is definitely less than ideal, um, largely just because uh, I haven't really had the time or the inclination to write a custom serializer. serializer. So uh, what we do instead, and I've talked to a few other folks who've done this native to, to JavaScript communication, and this seems to be pretty much how everyone is doing it. We take our deserialized uh, Java or Kotlin object, convert it back to a JSON string, we get a JSON object out of that JSON string, and the reason why we want it to be in a JSON object is so that we could pass it into that bundle JSON converter utility class, get our writable map, and then we can uh, use that when we emit our event with our whatever our key is, which is a string literal that uh, the JavaScript layer would use to subscribe to it and receive that object. In a perfect world, we would have some kind of POJO to writable map serialization, so we wouldn't need to have all these um, these steps in the middle. I found out yesterday that you guys also say POJO for plain old JavaScript object, I mean plain old Java object here. Um, <laughs> so ideally we'd be able to serialize just from, from that into the writable map. I haven't taken the time to write it yet, maybe I will, uh, but this is what we're using in the meantime. So then uh, putting, actually doing the, the publish part of publish subscribe is pretty straightforward. Whatever your app is, it's always going to look like this. You take in a, a writable map, you emit the event with whatever your event name uh, key string is. So this is just our index.js file that we have uh, sitting in our project that receives the event in the JavaScript layer. Super simple, we use the device event emitter which we just import from React Native, add a listener on that, um, on that key for the event that we emitted. We know that we could have a parameter called an order map that we could pull out. We have this utility function called get ETA interval from that uh, NPM module that I created and imported in. We do the calculation and then somehow send it back up to the native layer, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, in this particular component, we're just returning null in the render. You can absolutely render a UI component if you want to, and it's a single line of code just to set that as your layout um, on the native Android side. Here we're just doing calculations, so I'm returning null. And that's pretty much all there is to it in terms of sending, uh, communicating from Android down into the JavaScript layer. So Facebook tells us just some standard boilerplate code, some standard documentation for enabling your existing Android, Java, or Kotlin app to interface with React Native. Um, so the, the summary is you have an index.js file, a package.json as your root. Uh, you move all of your Android native code into an Android subdirectory. And then there's some code in your uh, Android activity, which is the first thing that gets fired up um, when your app runs to initialize the React Native host and run that. So that's all very good information, but that tells us nothing about how we could possibly communicate from JavaScript up into Android. Um, this also took me a little while to figure out how we do that. Um, so say that you have a React Native, we call it a greenfield application, where it's just your, your single repo, and you need to write a native module. For example, we did that in the driver app, where we have long-running background processes for um, posting their location at regular intervals. That we had to do as a native module, because the JavaScript bridge just isn't very resilient in terms of running for an extended period of time in the background. So there's some documentation for how to create a native module for your JavaScript app. 
So you're going to have to refer to that and then treat your existing Android app, even though it, it's, it's very counterintuitive because it, um, it's not a submodule, but you'll have to add that same boilerplate code so that that index.js in your root can treat it as a module, and then you get that communication in the same way. So when we call a native method from JavaScript now, after we have all that boilerplate code in, um, it's pretty straightforward. There's a module file that we add, and we can just add a React method uh, annotation. So annotations in Java are very similar to ECMAScript decorators in JavaScript, and it just tells us that this is the method that we want to expose so that it can be called by JavaScript. Um, so as soon as we have that React method that could be called by JavaScript, we just send that information back up. We can only send it up to this module file that's present in our native code, so we'll just have to use uh, whatever Android convention uh, we choose, there's a lot of standards for communicating that throughout the rest of the app, such as broadcast receiver, message bus, RX Java, uh, and so forth. So coming up with my conclusion, let's talk about, uh, just go back over what we, what we did. Why did we use React Native at ease? We had lots of React.js resources on the front end. We had very, very few mobile resources. We had no idea if we were going to get kicked out of the app store after we did all this hard work. Um, we, we've been kicked out several times, actually. We just keep rewriting it. So we need the ability to fail fast uh, and iterate quickly. Why do we want to share code with native uh, from JavaScript? The promise of velocity and the promise of parity. I make the argument that I think that parity is probably a, a, a bit of a stronger argument. Uh, but those are both good reasons. And velocity, you might get more long-term gains. Uh, when we want to communicate from native code into JavaScript, the steps are pretty much uh, serializing an object, emitting an event, and then subscribing to that event in the JavaScript layer. And for communicating from JavaScript back up to native, uh, the native app also needs those module bindings, not just what you would uh, add for um, integrating React Native into an existing native app. And then React method annotation for all the methods in your module file that you want to expose to the JavaScript layer. Okay, so that was my presentation. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, here's my contact info, email, Twitter. Uh, if you think that this sounds like really cool stuff that you'd like to work on, uh, Ease is growing like crazy. I started in November 2016. We've already tripled in size, and we'll be at the hiring mixer. So uh, I'd love to see you there if you want to talk about uh, my presentation or talk about Ease. Thanks a lot. Thank you.